I'm Jim Whaley. It's a great pleasure to welcome to the Cinema Showcase one of the most dynamic entertainers in the world, Miss Mitzi Gaynor. A tremendous success in films, on television, and the stage. She's right now touring in the fabulous Mitzi Gaynor show. So join me as I talk with Mitzi Gaynor on this Cinema Showcase. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining Cinema Showcase. And join me now in welcoming back here, home in the studio, Mitzi Gaynor. Mitzi, it's good to see you again. Thank you. It's lovely to see you. What is this, our seventh time that we've been I together? I believe so. We've got to stop meeting like this. <laughs> I mean, I have to put a whole new show together every single time we meet. It's costing me a fortune. You know, I think that is, of all the many fabulous things you do in your shows, one of the, one of the hallmarks of your shows is that they're literally always different. For example, this time on your, your tour across the country, people who see your show will see a whole new one than they saw last time, right? Yes. Uh, well, I, I figure, I don't think it's fair for somebody to pay for a show, one show, see it, and then have to pay to see it all over again. And also, I get tired of doing the same thing over and over and over again. I, um, I like to change. Um, I'm always thinking about what's new, what's different, what's ahead. Uh, new and different for us this year is the 1940s. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, I've done a lot of 40s things before, but this is one whole act of just the 40s, where we don't, you know, drop in a couple of songs that were written at another time, and uh, that was uh, it was hard to do because there was so, such a wealth of material, so many wonderful songs and so many wonderful characters and and uh, uh, people that. Uh, that we've all grown up with or that I've grown up with and now you know people are watching cable mm -hmm. and are watching um, syndicated programs and get a chance to see like the Andrews sisters and uh, Carmen Miranda and all those things are in our show. Now how do you go about deciding just what and, and, and what will not be in a show because you obviously are sent tons of material how do you decide just what will be right for for this particular season or whatever? Well um, I know what I can, by now, I've learned that much. I know what I can do. And uh, uh, we get ideas, certain people get certain ideas, and I'll say, yes, I've got to do that. For instance, uh, last show we put together, I wanted to do a, I wanted to do this, a whole section on, on Noel Coward, because I, I'm, I knew Noel Coward, and uh, I had, he wrote about me in a couple of his books. I was terribly flattered. And um, I thought his music was kind of marvelous, and I had studied, when I was studying classical music, semi-classical music, I learned some of his songs, you know, from Bittersweet and so on, the, the Goiner and all that kind of business. And uh, I thought, how marvelous to do this. So we started to put this section together, and um, Tommy Walsh, who's doing, you know, you know Tommy so well, who's doing this show, was doing that show, and uh, he would start rehearsing it, and he'd get the music, and he'd say, oh, well, when Mitzi gets here, she'll fix it. I mean, she'll do a certain, you know, thing. And, and I was thinking before I get to rehearsal, well, as soon as I get to rehearsal, Tommy will have worked this out for me because... I don't seem to be able to get this down. And so finally, after about a week of solid rehearsal, maybe 12 hours on this, which is a lot of time on, mm -hmm. on, a, on, a, on a conception, we all looked at each other and we said, I can't do this. You what? I can't <laughs> do this. And I can do, you know, I've got the guts of the world. I can do just about anything and lots of accents, but you have to be Noah Coward to do Noah Coward. Yeah. And that had to come out. And so then we found another piece that, um, uh, that we put in uh, called composers I have known and loved, uh, <laughs> composers who wrote songs for, like the, people who wrote Somewhere Over the Rainbow for Judy Garland wrote for me, You Too Can Be a Puppet. I mean, you can see who really got the hit songs. <laughs> but uh, there are things that you asked. The, I think the point of the question was, uh, how do you know what's good for you and how do, don't you know? I think uh, a lot of it has to, you have to get it on its feet. Mm -hmm. You have to get on the on the boards in the rehearsal hall, hit the bricks, as we say, and, and work on it. And um, sometimes it works, and then Sometimes it doesn't work. You know, talking about Noel Coward, you worked with him, I know, in, uh, in one of your films. Surprise uh, Package. Surprise uh -huh. Package, uh, the Stanley Donna did, which I think is a very fun movie. Good movie. Yeah. You and I are the only two people. Oh, Jack saw it, too, so that's three people. And I, I don't even think Gil Brenner bothered to go and see it. And Noel was off in Bermuda Darling or something. But that, that was a fun, I like that picture. Tell me about working with Noel Coward. 
We haven't talked about this before? I don't think so. Um, it's one of the main reasons I took the picture was because, first, well, I took the picture because I, I wanted to work with Hugh O'Brinner and I wanted to work with Stanley Donnan. And uh, Harry Kurnitz was the writer, and he was a very, very famous writer and had written, you know, a lot of, a lot of comedies and, and a lot of stories. that was based on an Art Buckwald? Yes, it was based on well, Art, right, yes, right. right. And it was called A Gift from the Boys. Mm. And they said that Noel, Noel Carver was going to play the king of a deposed, the deposed king of, of uh, Babulia or something. <laughs> and so he's in exile on this small island. This island happened to have been the island of Rhodes, Rhodos, one of the Greek isles. And um, we worked together, the unit, and then uh, it was around November. And then on Guy Fawkes Day, which is the 6th of November, we flew back to London. And on the 12th of November, one very fog, uh, foggy day, foggy day in, in London when they, that pea soup, you know, they call it pea soup fog, when the pea soup started to come through the cracks and, you know, uh, and, and all of a sudden the, the, you couldn't see each other and the cameraman said, all right, mates, that's it. Uh, the door flew open and there was Noah Coward in an astrakhan collared coat, fitted, <laughs> double-breasted, and one of those like overseas caps, you know, with long cigar, a cigarette holder with a big cigarette, and he said, have no fear, Noah Coward is here. <laughs> well, I let out a whoop, and I came running after him with everything jingling and jumbling and so on, because I was supposed to play kind of a tootsie in, in the, I'd never played a tootsie before. And uh, I ran, I just ran into him and I said, I'm so in love with you, and he said, I say, he said, dear child, it's Mitzi, isn't it? And I said, it is. Well, we were like this. We were, we became really, really good friends. And I would sit in his trailer with him. They have the dressing room on the stage. And he would tell me stories, regale me with stories about this and that and, and you know who and, and names and so on. A lot of the stuff I couldn't say to you here on the air. And they really used to have to pry us out of the dressing room because we were having such a good time together. I, I really... I loved him. He was a marvelous, marvelous man. I really think that when the definitive history of, of 20th century show business is written, in fact, it's, it's been said before now, that, uh, that Noel Coward will rank at the very, very top because there really was, was nothing he could not do and do well. V extremely well. And he was unique in the fact that nobody else can do him. <laughs> and uh, um, his style was an incredible style, a very arch, refined, pseudo, and yet classic chic. I mean, he really was a very classical man. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a very classical opinion of, of life, and uh, he uh, was a very fine thinker. I don't know if you've read his uh, diaries yeah. and so on. His latest uh, diary that Jack bought, for, my husband bought for me, um, he was talking about so many different things that I would think that he wouldn't have the scope because he was just, I have the talent to amuse. I mean, that was, that was the way he let you think. But, I mean, he thought a great deal about uh, life and communication mm -hmm. with people and, and uh, race, color, and creed and things that you wouldn't think that, sure. as, as I said, you wouldn't think you'd be interested in. But and you touched on this a minute ago when you pointed out what, what marvelous songs she wrote. I think that I'll Follow My Secret Heart is yes, one of the most one of beautiful, beautiful songs. beautiful and most difficult songs mm -hmm. to sing. And Mad Dogs and Englishmen, oh. Nina from Argent Argentina. Mm -hmm. um, oh, we went through so. Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Uh, the comedy, wonderful co com comedic uh, lines. I think one of my favorites of his was the um, the satirical bit he did on on, on Cole Porter's yes, song. Let's yes, yes. Let's do it. Let's do it. Marvelous. <laughs> I was going to do that too, uh, honey. I was doing everything, <laughs> but nothing was working. And Walsh had the greatest idea. Uh, he thought that he would do it like a set. We never use a set. We only use a psych. We're kind of unique in that. And uh, we, we create pictures for you, hopefully, in front of your very eyes. And he was going to have one boy as a palm tree, see, and one boy kind of on all fours, and he would be a table. And uh, another boy kind of would be, uh, another boy with his back to me would be Noel Coward, you know, smoking a cigarette like this. And even that didn't work, so uh, it just... <laughs> And then you pick a thing like um, uh, talking about the composers things that we did the thing that we did the last time. Jack said, "I'm getting a little nervous. We're spending too much time on this." Jack produces everything that we do, and Wall said, "Yeah, I'm getting a little nervous too." And Jack folded his arms and looked very Irish and very impish, which he does, and crinkly blue eyes. And he said, uh, "What about all the composers that you've worked with?" It took us seven minutes to put the whole thing together. 
My goodness. I mean, right there. You know, somebody sat down at the piano and went, brr -bum, and we finished up with um, uh, 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 a honey bun, and I'm in love with a wonderful guy. Mm. I talked about my audition with Cole Porter um, and how I got into show business with the Civic Light Operas, and, and bing, 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 and that was it. It's incredible. One of the other hallmarks of, of all of your shows is the fabulous array of costumes that you wear. And I understand that this time Bob Mackey has designed um, a whole new lavish wardrobe for you, and he's not really uh, designing that much individually anymore, is he? Well, Bob has, um, has moved on. Since there's not a weekly variety any, any longer, and since there's all, nil uh, variety programs, but specials as, as they call um, he went into ready, ready to Wear, and his line is called Bob Mackey Originals. Good title. Mm -hmm. And um, we all, you know, in, in, in the biz, we all think it's kind of wonderful for him because now civilians, people who aren't in show business, can wear these exquisite creations that, that Bob, uh, as only Bob can do. I mean, a beaded evening gown by Bob Mackey is unique and remarkable because there's usually only one of them. And uh, he hand paints and hand draws it himself, so it's like getting a, a painting that someone has beaded over. Now, I've been a very close, I hope a very close, I love him very much, a, a good friend of his since I was the first lady he did, in other words, in 1966. And um, uh, we get along very well. And uh, I've seen Bob grow and grow and grow and grow. And now that he's into this, this other area of his, of his talent, uh, it's hard to say, Bobby, you've got to do this. Please help me. You've got to do it. Because uh, he says, well, if I'm going to do it for you, then I have to do it for other people. But fortunately, I'm the only lady walking around the country doing this kind of a show. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm blessed with his super, super natural, nat natural talents. I still believe, and I'm not just saying this because you're here, but when a book came out a couple of years ago that, uh, that Bob Mackey did, in which he talked about designing for the great ladies he's designed for, uh, and, and the, the front and back jackets of this book were were uh, uh, illustrated, <laughs> wonderful word, <laughs> illustrated <laughs> with, 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 with photographs of some of the, the stunning things he had done. And to me, the most beautiful thing on there was, uh, was you in this blue gown, I believe, that he did. Oh, Jim, how nice. Thank you. Just, just beautiful. Yeah, he, he gets inside of you. He really does. He doesn't just do costumes or clothes. Um, when when we're going to put a show together, he'll come and watch rehearsals so he'll know what he's doing. You know, most people say, ah, you're singing a ballad, so I'll do it in such and such. Well, maybe it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. um, one time we had an opening number with the last show, and he had done a marvelously intricate kind of a skirt. And I said, Bob, I don't think it's going to work. And he said, well, let me see it. He's an Aries, by the way. And, you know, Aries are very definite people. And you just twitched. Are you an Aries? <laughs> no, no. Well, you know, Aries can do 85, people, 85 things all at the same time. And he said, well, let me just take a look at it. And so he looked at the number, and he looked at his sketch, and he took a black pencil and just X'd it right out. That's how secure the man is. I mean, he's just marvelous. You know, with me, I would say, oh, you can't take out my dress. My dress is so perfect. <laughs> can we use it in another place? Can we change it? He's, um, he's very special. You know, he's when you look guy. at the history of Hollywood and so forth, it's amazing to think of the influence Hollywood costume designers and, and fashion designers have had on the entire world of fashion, going back to Adrian at mm -hmm. MGM, mm -hmm. and some of the marvelous people, I guess, who, who did Fox have. Charles Lemaire was in charge of the uh, of the wardrobe department there, and um, Charlie just passed away not yeah, too long ago. Did yeah. you read that? Yeah, I did. What, was he ninety years old? Something like a high, uh, yeah. uh, high bless 80s. his heart. Yeah. yeah, you must have known him at Fox. I knew you? him very well. He was very nice to me. Mm -hmm. I used to sit and listen to all of his stories about. See, I started at Fox when I was seventeen. So just before my 18th birthday, and um, I, I, coming from a show business family and uh, you know, being imbued with all of this uh, respect for older people who have been in the business for a long time and wanting to learn, and I would just sit in his office and he would tell me stories, oh, about you know, Ziegfeld and so on and so forth. And I, from my family, had, I knew who these people were. So I've been very lucky in my lifetime working with people that I already knew who they were before. Like you, look at you. See, I knew exactly who. <laughs> um, he was a nice man, funny man, cryptic. Mm -hmm. You know, he created the gold mesh bag. Really? Mm. I did not know that. But there's no reason for you to know that. <laughs> well, that's a piece your of your grandma information probably, that... <laughs> or yeah, your grandmother probably might have had a gold mesh bag. It yeah. used to be very, very. One costume, one costume designer you worked with at MGM 
on Lay Girls. And in fact, he won an Oscar for uh, for Lay Girls. Ori Kelly Ori, did wonderful. some wonderful costumes for that film. Yeah, very good. Crazy man. Really? Really. We were going across the street together, and he was going against the light. And I said, Ori, get back on the curb. He said, No, no, they won't bump into us. I've got a cold. <laughs> It was great. I remember reading stories that when he was at Warner Brothers that uh, that Jack L. Warner just could not do a thing with him, that he just gave up trying. Yes. That Rory Kelly would come in and design for Betty Davis when he wanted to and then leave. And that was true. Well, that's because all the ladies wanted Ori Kelly to design, all the producers' wives wanted Ori Kelly to design clothes for them. <laughs> Pretty smart, huh? Clever, indeed. Clever. And he was the best friend of a lot of people, of Richard Rogers' wife and yeah. the, of, uh, of Dorothy Hammerstein and... and uh, uh, he had very nice contacts with a lot of really heavyweight people. Not mm -hmm. meaning heavyweight, but mm -hmm. I mean important people. It was always amusing, very, very amusing. And to look at him, you would never know that he was, you know, such a marvelous costume designer. I mean, he, I don't know, it, it, it looked like he could have been a comic, you know. I mm -hmm. mean, he wore like slouch hats and coat collars turned up, and he could have been maybe a song and dance guy. And uh, I'm sure he did everything in the theater before he became a costume designer. Well, we're talking about... Um some of your years at Fox. I want to ask you about some of the, uh, the many marvelous people you must have worked with there. And these are people you don't hear that much about. That's why I want to talk about them. We may have touched on this in the past, and if we have, we have a, a new audience watching probably, and I hope some older ones too. Um, in the musical areas, Fox, I think, had one of the musical geniuses of all time with Alfred Newman, yes. who ran that department. Yes. And I'm wondering what your contact with with Al Newman was like and how much was his influence felt musically. I know you worked with him on South Pacific later on. Yes. I didn't work with him in any of my other pictures. I, I worked with his brother Lionel. Mm -hmm. And um, you see Alfred was the head of the department. And when Alfred first started, uh, he came from other studios and finally won when Zanuck hired him, put him uh, under contract and he became the head of the department. And uh, he would only do things like Love is a Many Splendid Thing, and, you know, and uh, Zanuck produced things, or, or later on Buddy Adler produced things and so on. And uh, when South Pacific came up, of course, everybody being such good friends. Cute uh, story about um, when Alfred Newman went to London the first time, he sent a wire to Oscar Hammerstein, and it said, um, Dear Oscar, da 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 dum, and the, and the final line was, England is like a garden. Love, Alfred. Several years later, when Oscar was in London. He sent Alfred a wire that said, yes, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of rapport they had. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was, I loved working with Alfred. Alfred was um, a tyrant, naturally, mm -hmm. as he had to be. Everybody loved and adored him. Um, he created the 20th Century Fox logo, da 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 da, yeah. da, da, da you know, this. Uh, the most uh, wonderful thing, I think, he, you know, he was ill for quite some time. And um, before he passed away, Ross Hunter asked him to do the uh, theme song for Airport. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of his most beautiful things. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we were, I, I, didn't re I didn't realize I hadn't known that Alfred was that ill. Mm -hmm. And the night after the sneak preview, I called him. In, I was in Los Angeles, and I called him. And his wife answered the phone, and I was chatting with her for the moment. And I just said, we saw the show last night, and oh, the music is incredible. And may I speak with Alfred? And she said, well, he's taking a nap right now. And I said, well, when he wakes up, no, no, no. Just tell him I think it's some of his very, very best work and, and how beautiful and how much the, and I'm sure he's going to be nominated for an Academy Award and so on and so forth. And later I talked to Jack, and I said, I talked with the, uh, Mrs. Newman, and he said, well, how's Alfred doing? I said, he was taking a nap. And he said, well, he's really not well at all. Mm -hmm. And about, uh, I guess, two weeks later, he passed away. Yeah. But yeah. I was, this, I don't want this to f seem maudlin to you, but I was so grateful that I had a chance, I had not spoken to him since South Pacific, that I had a chance to convey to him how wonderful I thought sure. that his new project was. And, um, and you were right, the music was nominated for an it Oscar. It was, And unfortunately yes. lost to, uh, I think, a far inferior score in Love Story. But well, those are but the way those, that things, that's, yeah. that's it. You know, when I did Georgie Girl on the Academy Awards, yeah. Born Free won. Yeah. And uh, everybody at the party after the Academy Awards said, gee, if you had, well, I said, well, I didn't. <laughs> so, I mean, you can't vote right then and there. That was for the, for the television show. You know, I was talking to somebody not long ago, and they, are, they were talking about great moments in Academy Award presentation history. Um, and they didn't come up with too many. But one of the ones that, that they said is like, would rank high on anybody's list was that fabulous rendition of Georgie Girl that you did. 
I really had nothing to do with that, honestly. Uh, I just danced it. I mean, it was not my concept. It was nothing. We were in Puerto Rico, working in Puerto Rico, and Johnny Green called and spoke with Jack and said, uh, the Academy Awards are coming up, and Jack said yes, and he said, where are you going to be after Puerto Rico, because we're getting a lot, you know, this kind of, you know, hello, 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 hello. <laughs> so we went, we were on our way to Reno, and so Jack said, I'll get in touch with you when we get to Reno, which he did. And uh, Johnny Green said, would you, oh, John Green now, excuse me, um, would Mitzi like to do Georgie Girl? And uh, Jack said, what? None of us had seen the picture, <laughs> more or less heard the tune. So uh, he said, and you can have anybody you want do it. You can have any choreographer that you want. You can have anybody costume design it. Uh, Jimmy Tritipo is doing the sets, Tritipo, and he'd, he and I had worked together a couple of times on something else. And so Jack said, what do you think? And I said, well, yeah, I haven't done that in a long time. Uh, the last time I had done it, I did it with Donald O'Connor when Donald O'Connor hosted from the Pantages Theater. So I uh -huh. guess, you know, Jack and I weren't even married yet. We were dating, so you know that that's been a couple of weeks. And uh, so I said, let's do it. So uh, Ernie Flatt, uh, who uh, had worked with me and I had known like all of my life and then went on to do the Carol Burnett show mm -hmm. and, you know, Superman on Broadway and so on. And Sugar Babies. Oh. And... Uh, uh, he, I said, would you do the number? He said, of course he would, and he donated his service. And, and uh, uh, Bob Mackey, since we were working together, this was our first year together, uh, he said he'd love to, and he donated his services. And my, I could use my own musicians. I had a guitar player and a drummer and, and a pianist. And everybody couldn't have been kinder or nicer, and I had my own dancing guys. One of the dancers on the show was Leroy Reams. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, from Applause, and sure. uh, as you very well know and uh, from 42nd Street. And as I say, I had nothing to do with it. I just went out and everybody did all the work uh -huh. and I just had, had the fun of well, it. Well, it apparently conjures up wonderful memories and those, uh, those who, who think of great, great Oscar. Well, In fact, that and I, whatever number Angela Lansbury did um, a few years ago, uh, I, don't, I don't remember what it, what it is, but, but your number and, and one Angela Lansbury did yes, were I can't, singled out. Yes, I can't remember what it was either, but she said in an interview before that, she said, I'm going to kick harder than Sid Charisse, which I thought <laughs> was great. Absolutely. Uh, do you remember when um, Rug Hudson and Mae West did Baby It's Cold Outside? No. Oh, that's where, <laughs> oh. Rock says, I really can't stay, you know, like this. She says, but baby, it's cold outside. <laughs> oh, and she was up on a, you know, on a poof because he was so much bigger than she. <laughs> Another good song was uh, that Kirk Douglas did with uh, Burt Lancaster called It's Great Not to, not be, to nominated. be Nominated. Yeah. yeah. That's great. <laughs> we don't have that much time left, and there was something have else. Have I, I done wanted. it again, Jim? No, no, no. <laughs> we could talk for, for, for days. Um, one thing we haven't touched on before, you have worked uh, in Hollywood with some of the, the, the real legendary people on, on screen. Uh, and I'm thinking of people like uh, Ethel Merman, Marilyn Monroe, etc. Now, what I'm curious about, we always hear and read about these temperamental movie stars during, during this period, the 40s and 50s and so forth. Uh, uh, did you ever see any of that in your years in Hollywood? Real temperament, yeah. stamping their feet and throwing yeah, down so Stomping off the set because something wasn't right or... No. I've seen frustration. I've seen, uh, and I've done it myself, you get so mad at yourself that, uh, like in a dance number and, and uh, you're ready and you go for something and it just doesn't work or you slip or you fall, I've, I've seen that. But I've not seen I suppose by the time I got into films in 1950, that's a couple of weeks ago, I th and the business was beginning to change mm -hmm. then. I, I, don't, I don't think I've seen. I don't th I think I've seen that. I've seen it on the stage. I've seen uh, stage managers throw their clipboard on the floor and stomp their feet, <laughs> but I've never. I don't think I've ever. So I've only been lucky enough to work with pros. Yeah. And um, I, I've seen pros get like upset with Marilyn because. She was going through a, a very heavy period when we did no business like show business. Tough. She was going through a divorce with Joe DiMaggio. Uh, she was going through uh, uh, psychoanalysis or whatever. She was going to somebody to help her, you know, get all this straightened out. She was becoming the probably most incredible movie star ever to have happened mm. in our lifetime. And um, 
uh, she was working with a, with a dramatic coach who was saying, you are a bubble, you are a bubble, you will float, you will float. <laughs> I mean, the girl, and, and all we could think, I was, uh, you know, Ethel and I, you know, the two broads, right, I would say, just get the lines out, honey. You know, I mean, I was, you know, in love with this man that I was going to marry. Ethel was happily married, and Ethel was Ethel Merman. I mean, uh -huh. you don't mess around with that. Right. So uh, we couldn't really see what she was so upset about all the time. Is that dumb? Now, there's two schools of thought, though. I've talked both to, to Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis, who, as you know, worked with her on Some Like It Hot. Yes. And Jack Lemmon says to this day he doesn't believe there was a mean bone in her body. I don't that think when, so either. That when she was late, it was because of problems within herself, that she did not do that to hurt anybody else. Tony Curtis, however, doesn't have anything nice to say about her. But Now, that's kind of interesting because I think, isn't Tony Curtis a Gemini and she's a Gemini, or she was a Gemini? Mm -hmm. And generally, um, see, Gemini people, like my mother was a Gemini, Gemini people are, are marvelous and wonderful. And they'll say, Jim, I'll see you tomorrow at 1 o'clock. And four years later, you bump into them at a party. And you say, what happened to you? And they say, what? <laughs> I mean, it's like, whee! It's, you know, it's very, it's, it's, it's an interesting sign. <laughs> so she could be so incredibly funny and witty. Yeah. And then she'd be like another whole different person. And... Um, I think with somebody like that, you have to have a lot of patience, sure, you know. Sure. And I, I guess a lot of us, like I'm a very, I'm a very impatient person and uh, super critical, mm -hmm. starting with myself. And uh, I'd get ticked off every so often because we would, you know, Donald and I would have to work so hard in certain numbers and all Marilyn would have to do, now I'm psychoanalyzing myself, yeah. You know, <laughs> she'd have to stand up on the count of four and walk down there on the count of eight and turn around and come back while we're doing double nip-ups and back flips. And no, she did not. I agree wholeheartedly with uh, Lemon. I don't think she did any of yeah. this on purpose. Well, we're out of time. Once again, this has been an absolute delight. And I want to urge everybody, if they want to see a fabulous show, including you do a bit of, of Dr. Ruth in your show now. Yeah, I do. Wonderful. Uh -huh. yes. Thank you so much, darling. It's going to come and see me in case you have any problems. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Okay. How better to end a program? My thanks to you, Mitzi. This has been Thank a delight. You, My thanks to all of you. Until next time.